right, we are back in the lab today with the Spark Station 20. And even though it took me a while, I finally have the correct timekeeper chip for this machine. And I can see why people dremel them out and do all that kind of stuff, because this was actually fairly difficult to get. Um, I wanted to order them from Mauser, but Mauser kept pushing back the in-stock date. They didn't have any in stock. And first it was going to be... November, and then it was going to be December, and then it was going to be March, and, uh, <laughs> you know, I didn't know if they would ever come, and March is too long. I want to get this kind of straightened out before then. Um, so I had to order from a different supplier. Uh, this is TME, uh, which is out of the EU, although they do have a U.S. branch. This part came from Poland. And uh, I've been trying to decipher the date code here because while new old stock for a lot of chips is okay, for these that contain a lithium battery, you know, I don't want to buy something ancient that's just going to be dead. And I think that these are um, from 2014. So about 10 years ago at time of recording. Um, and that's better than the alternative, which is something from you know, like 2004 or 1999. Um, but uh, according to this, and according to a post on the SG Thomas website, uh, this right here means it's a year ending in four, the 35th week of that. Unfortunately, sounds like you can't get more precise than that. At least that's what it said on the, um, on the website, on the forum for this manufacturer. Uh, but hopefully these will work long enough, and if I get 10 years worth of use out of them, that's probably good enough. <laughs> so let's get this opened up, installed, make sure it keeps time, and then we can run through the process, again, probably using the Amiga, to actually uh, set the system ID and the MAC address and all that kind of stuff. So on the back we've got three screws, again, to release it. One here, one here. And then one all the way at the end here. Now, once we have all three screws out, we should be able to just lift up and pull back. The pullback is so we don't damage these tabs that are on the back of the, uh, of the top case. Now we need to remove the S-Bus card so that we can get at the, uh, at the chip location. Uh, but these are held in by screws. There's two screws on either side here, at least in this style of S-Bus card. There's an alternate style that has them on the top, but for these, there are two right here. Now with these out, there were two of them per card. We should be able to just pull up the S-Bus cards and gently slide them out. There's one, and let's get the other here. And now that we've done that, there is our timekeeper chip. Nice easy access to it. Now this has a uh, little thing around it to make it easy to remove. Now I did this off camera, but it has two little lips on it that you can pull out. I had to actually exert a lot more pressure to get it out, but here it is. and. Um, so we take the chip out and it goes in here and then this goes into the socket. Now this label on here doesn't mean anything. I've already done some research. Later Sun machines would actually have part of the Ethernet address here. But this, this sequence of numbers is just gibberish. If Sun still existed, then uh, we might be able to figure out from Sun what this meant you know, call it in, but I don't think we can do that with Oracle. When looking at these side by side, this is the new one and this is the old one, we can tell that they're different. And uh, this may be what this little sled is for, is actually not for ease of installation, but as an adapter. Um, this is, though, the right chip to put in here. Like I've, I've double-checked that multiple times from multiple sources. So... 
Um, so, but this is a bit of a mystery as to why these are different, and I suspect I may have to peel off the the top barcode here to see what this actually is. Um, it's probably a pin compatible version of this. All right, so we have the Spark Station hooked up to a different Amiga this time using the serial console again and if we look here at the bottom we can still see ID prom contents are invalid however I know that the chip is working because I set the auto boot flag which is stored in NVRAM I set that to false right because by default if there's no contents of the chip, it'll try and boot off the network. Well, I set that to false and it dropped right into the OK prompt. And I unplugged the machine for, eh, you know, about an hour and a half or so while I ate something. And came back and it's still like this. So, I think this chip is good. And uh, I'm going to put the machine back together. And then we'll switch over to a, an Amiga that I can video capture from to actually do the procedure where we load back in the ethernet address and do some other things. So I've got this back together but I'm kind of struck by how even when you're careful you can have wear and tear. Um, I don't know if you can see this but this uh, plastic shielding around this captive screw is starting to come apart. I'm going to have to look at earlier video. I think this was starting to come apart before I messed with it, but it's it's gotten obviously worse. And even worse, I broke the uh, the left side foot. Um, I'm going to see if I can put this back together, but um, I'm going to slide this along the table, and the foot caught and came right out. You see the little snaps here are no longer fully attached. This was a fairly common failure. I remember seeing a lot of Spark Station 20s and Spark Station 10s missing their feet. And they're just decorative, although this one does protect the internal speaker. But it still, you know, just makes me remark on kind of how fragile some of this technology is getting. All right, so we are back on my Amiga. And this is a different Amiga. This is my Amiga 4000 using a program called Term as a terminal emulator. And I've got a null modem cable hooked up between the Amiga and the Spark Station 20 uh, so that I can use the Amiga as a serial console for the Spark Station. Now, if you missed my disclaimer in the last video, um, when you're using an Amiga for... Uh, a console for a serial console for other machines you have to be careful because the Amiga serial port is non-standard and on some of the pins there are voltages and so you just really need to be careful and check your cables to make sure that you're not wiring any of those pins with voltages to any of the pins on the, the spark station or whatever you're trying to connect to with standard cabling you're probably unlikely to do that but better safe than sorry. So in this other window here, I've got uh, the instructions that I've downloaded and are, are linked to where I got these. And we'll be going through these instructions kind of one by one here to set the Ethernet MAC address of this machine back. What we're going to be doing is setting a bunch of bytes. And uh, it looks like the first one is going to be to set the version number. So we're set it as 1 to the 0th byte. One, oops, one, zero, MKP. Then next we want to set the machine type, and there's a, a table here. And it looks like for Spark Station 20, the magic number here is 72. And so if we go back up here, uh, we want to do 72.1 MKP.
And next we need to set the MAC address. So we know the first three digits are 8020. So we do 882MKP03, MKP24, MKP. Now then for the five, six, and seven bytes, I have to look up what the MAC address was for this machine. And it's going to be 25MKP. 53, 6MKP, and 9F7MKP. And then we set the date of manufacture, which I don't really know what this is, and it seems like from this guide it doesn't matter. So we will go 08MKP, 09MKP, how many of these do we need? And we'll go through hex B. And then we'll set the last three bytes of the host ID, which are usually the last three bytes of the MAC address. So C, D, and E we will uh, replace with uh, 20 C, MKP, 53 D, MKP, and then 9FEMKP. And then we have to do a bit of fourth here to uh, compute the checksum and store that, which is stored in F. Zero F zero, do uh, prom at XOR loop. Okay, so that should have set it. So now if we do a reset all, or actually, I think on this spark, it's just a reset. And see if that took. All right, and that does appear to have taken, right? We can now see as part of our boot message, we can see the serial number, um, Ethernet address, and the host ID. So that's great. All right, and now that it's completed all its memory checks, we can see there's no error message anymore. And so we have successfully reset the Ethernet address in here and, uh, and fixed our, our NVRAM issues. So very happy with this. This Spark Station is now ready again to use on the network. And now I need to get an operating system on it.